We are doing a series right now. We're finishing up this series, actually, this month called I Believe in God. We're talking about God the Holy Spirit. It's so intriguing to me uh, how, how God gives us so much. He's so generous, and he gives us his spirit, and I love that. And I bought this shirt um, in the middle of July, and it says the absence of fear. And I was thinking about the title of this message, and I was just kind of, and I was wearing this shirt yesterday. I didn't even wash it. Sorry. But I was wearing this yesterday. And I was like, man, I can't think of a title. I can't think, Lord, give me a title. Give me a title. The absence of fear. All right. <laughs> and so this has been on my heart for a while. Um, just, I've been meditating on this absence of fear. And I'll just tell you that when God is present, fear is absent. When God is present, fear is absent. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been struggling and battling with fear lately? With worry, anxiety. It's a phenomenon. It, it, it's, it's, it's plaguing the body of Christ. The world, I get it. The world, people that are not uh, uh, yet of the faith, I get it. They, they have pills for it, I get it. They, they need therapy, I get it. They, they, need, they need CBD oil, I get it. THC, I get it. You know what that is. I get it. But the people of God? But us? God's children? Plagued? I fear, man, I, I, I struggle with fear so, for so many, so many years, just tormented by a night terrors and sleep paralysis and, and just afraid of the dark. And, and, and yet I was so afraid, but I was drawn to it. Could not, I, it's almost like I, 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 was, I was afraid of it, but yet I could not get away from it. And I was drawn to, to dark things and demonic things. And, and I was encountering things at night. And so, so I had so, so much fear in my life that it manifested in, 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 in possessive behavior. In obsessive behavior. And, and control freak type behavior. OCD type behavior. It manifested itself in jealousy. In envy. In comparison. It manifested itself in now lust. And, 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 it, and it manifested itself for me stiff arm and authority and pushing back people that try to help me i would push them away god would send people to 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 set order in my life and to mentor me and to pastor me but i would say you have an agenda there's something that you want from me you're trying to control me so every time god would send somebody to to give me that guidance to be a shepherd in my life because i had so much fear in my life i didn't trust him i had trust issues i couldn't trust authority period it manifested in so many different areas, and then it started now physically messing with me to where I, I would find myself uh, battling allergies and having the, uh, a hard time breathing, you know, correctly, and just cold sweats and always sweaty palms and, and sweaty feet. Right? It manifested physically because, see, that your brain releases a chemical uh, that 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 tells you fright, you know, it freeze, flight, you know, run. It, it basically says survival, you know, you're in danger. And when you're always in danger, your body begins to break down. And so the, the point is this, are you dealing with some of those symptoms that I've mentioned? You can't turn it off. You can't stop thinking of the worst case scenario. And your mind quickly goes to worry and you're consumed with news and you want to know what's going on and, and, and you're just drawn to all the bad things that are happening in the world and you just know, you know the tragedies that happen. And I, I think we need to be informed. Let's not be ignorant, right? But the point is you're just drawn to it. You're anxious and you got these physical pains and, and your body's just saying, hey, you're, you're so tense. You need a massage, right? Do you have fear in your life? Maybe you've agreed with it. Maybe you have a relationship with it. Maybe you have allowed it. Maybe it's become normal for you. Maybe you're putting up with something that God defeated. Maybe what... What, what you have uh, identified yourself with, the label that's over you is, is anxious and depressed and, and, and fearful and worry. And they, maybe, maybe you've called yourself, I'm just a worry, uh, a, a worm. This is who I am. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a helicopter type parent. I'm always worried. I'm always worried. Maybe you've labeled that yourself as a person of fear. Maybe you said, I'm just an introvert. I, I, I get socially anxious and I, I don't like big parties. I've done that too. I, I, don't, I just feel a little off. I need somebody to come with me, to walk with me. I just, I just don't feel, you know, maybe you've agreed with it. Maybe you have a partnership with it. And you don't even realize it. See, when God is present, fear is absent. Uh, there's a scripture that I want to read, and Paul is telling Timothy, he's saying this to Timothy. I hope I got your attention. He's saying this to Timothy, his protege, his, uh, his student. Um, he raised him up to be a leader. And Paul is in prison now, and he's facing death. And he's in prison because he was bold and he was declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. And so now he's incarcerated, he's persecuted for it. And the end is near for Paul, the apostle, the great apostle Paul. And he's writing to Timothy, the second letter in 2 Timothy, and he's telling them, he's telling them, hey, I know that you have been filled with faith and word, and, and you, have, you come from a great lineage, and your ancestors, your, 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 your grandma and your mother, they prayed for you, and, and you are a person of faith. But he says, remember this, and we'll read this in 2 and Timothy. And the reason why he's telling this to Timothy is because Timothy is afraid. He's afraid that he's going to end up in jail and in prison just like Paul. He's afraid that it's going to cost him his life to declare the good news. And he doesn't want to visit Paul because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, to have the same consequences that Paul is now facing. So he says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, I'm going to read it again. I remind you to stir up the gift, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Some of you have the Spirit of God within you, but it's not stirred up. And some of you have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But my goal and my desire is through this message that it'll be stirred up, that if, if you've received it, that it's going to be stirred up, that you remember uh, what God has given you and what it's for. And then also, I want you, if you've never received it, to open up your heart and your life to receive the Holy Spirit, God himself living within you, and I want you to receive that, okay? So, so understand this, that oftentimes when a person would receive the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, it was through the laying on of hands. It was an impartation. Let's read this in Acts 19.6. It says this, and this is Paul. Um, uh, it's speaking of Paul. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, a group of people, some people, read it with me, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in Spanish. No, and in other tongues. And prophesied. They spoke a heavenly language. And God understood what they were saying. And, and, and they prophesied. They began to speak and foretell the future. They were speaking truth into existence. Okay? So laying on the hands is, is important. So at the end of the service, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, I'm going to lay my hands on you, on your shoulder or on your head, and so will the prayer team. And we're going to declare, receive the Holy Spirit. You look into our eyes. We're going to say, receive the Holy Spirit if you've never received that in Jesus' name. Okay? So I'm going to keep reading what, what, he was, what, what he's writing to Timothy that applies to us. In 2 Timothy, I'm going to go back to verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7. And it says this. Now read this with me. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm going to leave it up there for a second. Those are my three points today. Power, love, and sound mind. If the presence of God is in your mind, in your heart, in your vessel, all, you as a vessel, you're going to have power, you're going to experience love, and you're going to have a sound mind. If you do not have the Holy Spirit filling you to the point that you're full, if the Holy Spirit is not stirred up within your heart, you have no power, love, and a sound mind. These are the three areas that people struggle with and battle with the most. They don't feel powerful. They have issues with love, relationships, hello. And they don't have a sound mind, cannot control their thought life. But when... The Spirit of God is present. Fear is absent. Amen? 
And so, so it's important for us to read this. Now, now, the Bible says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he says something about the earth that's, 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 that's crazy. He says, and the earth was formless, had no form. Formless, it was empty, and it was dark. And then the Spirit of God moved, and God began to speak, and things began to take form. And the earth was filled, and it was no longer dark, because God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's interesting because, because a vessel, you are a vessel. You were made to be filled. You were made to be full. Okay? You know what it feels like to have an empty stomach? What, is it, what does your body say to you? Feed me. When you have an empty stomach, you have stomach hunger pains, and you get angry, right? Like me. Oh, I'm hungry now. Your spirit was meant to be filled and if you are hungry and you don't fill it you'll have spirit hunger pains and the bible says that blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled the point is your spirit is hungry what are you filling it with all right the spirit of god fills us and then we begin to take form. Now, this is what God had in mind. Truth forms us. It's the original formation. And now I begin to reflect what God had in mind when he created me. He has a purpose. And he has a plan for my life. Truth does that. But then also he fills us with his love. He fills us with peace and joy and all the things that we need. And we have a light in us. And just like the world was lit, so is our life. So is our hearts. So is our mind. But absent the spirit of God, you're formless. Your marriage looks like... God didn't, that's not what God had in mind. Even your mind, your body, and the way that you, you, uh, you, you believe yourself to be your identity, God says, like, that's not what I had in mind. You know, the way that you carry on, the way you speak, and, and, and the things that you agree with, God says, that doesn't look like me. That's not what I, no, no, you need truth so that that could take place. And, and a lot of us uh, can find ourselves empty, and God says, my spirit was meant to fill you, to illuminate you. That's why Jesus is called the light of the world, and we're called the light of the world. You see it? So, so, so in the beginning, uh, when God spoke and earth was formed, it was, it was taking form, and it was filled, and it was, it, was, it was light, now he creates mankind. Mankind is now filled with the Spirit of God, and, and he's taken on the, the formation, the image and likeness of, of God himself. And, and, and mankind is... is in partnership with God, the Holy Spirit and God, um, the Holy Spirit and man's spirit are in partnership. But after the fall, Adam and Eve, do you know the first emotion that they felt once they sinned was fear? They hid themselves because they were afraid. They hid themselves because they were fearful. Jesus Christ came to die in our place for the forgiveness of sins. He rose again from the grave and he made a promise that we would receive the Holy Spirit. What Jesus came to give is what Adam and Eve lost. Everything that Jesus came to give and what we receive is what we once had in Adam and Eve. The point is this, apart from the Spirit of God, you have the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear is when you are consumed with anxiety, when you are consumed with worry and concern, when you are always in need to control. And that's one of the reasons why people abuse others and, and why people mistreat others is because they're so fearful. That's why you become a workaholic, because you're fearful of being poor. And that's why you do the things that you do, because fear hovers over you and it's a slave task master. But God says, I haven't given you that spirit. God says, I came to free you from that. I see you be a slave. I see you worry. I, I see you sick because you, you're so full of fear. I, I see you, you destroying your relationships because you don't trust anybody. I, I see you struggling and battling with fear. God says, I didn't come to give you that. I came to take that away. Now, fear is a gift from God because it keeps us alive. Now, that kind of fear is good. That's a natural fear, but the enemy capitalizes on God's uh, blessings and he makes some curses. He capitalizes on things that are good for us and he turns it around and it becomes bad for us. Here's the point. You're going to feel fear if you have change in your life. Anybody have some change coming up? A new job, a new school, something, a new neighborhood, a new, 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 change, change. It's going to bring some anxiety, some fear. That's normal, 
right? Uncertainty. If you're not certain about something, you have no stability. You're going to have fear in your life. If, 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 if I were to give you the mic and say, hey, what's God saying to you right now? Your heart's going to pound. You're like, uh, some of you are going to be like, give me that mic. I got something to say. <laughs> Others, I'm going to be really afraid. If I put you on the spot right now and I say, hey, what sins have you been struggling with right now? Come up here and talk about them. You're going to get anxious. If I give you a certain amount of attention, you're going to get you're going to get anxious. If you're struggling, it brings about fear. If you're struggling with something, it brings about fear. Those things are normal. But, but the point is, the spirit of fear is when you've made an agreement with an actual demonic entity. This is when you've made an agreement and it's become your identity. Now you look like fear. Now you reflect it. Now you, you're an evangelist for fear. Now you spread the gospel of fear. Now, now you give allegiance to fear. Now it's an idol in your life. Now, now I'm telling you, now it's something that has taken over your soul. Okay? And a lot of people don't even realize they've done this. So, but God came and he gave us this blessing. I love this because, see, this is, this is it. I want to give you some hope up front. Romans chapter 8, 15 says this. This is powerful. It says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves because that's what fear does. But instead, see, see, fear makes you a slave. God's spirit makes you a son. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him daddy. I'm a father. We don't call him master, though he is. He's my dad. Not a slave, I'm a son. Fear makes you a slave. God's spirit makes you a son. And that's the promise, and that's what we need today. So the powerful thing is this. Um, Paul tells us what the Spirit gives us, uh, among many things. Like, there were so many things that I could talk about. Next week, I'll talk about more of the Holy Spirit. And, and so the Holy Spirit does this. It gives you power. That's my first point. It gives you power, and we're all drawn to power in different ways. It's natural for us. How many of you work out? Would you raise your hand? You want to be powerful, right? I just want to be healthy. You want to look good because you want to be powerful. Okay? You're drawn to power. People get educated because they don't want to appear ignorant. They want some power. Uh, People, they want to climb up a corporate ladder because they're seeking influence. They're seeking control. They're seeking power. The political world is all about power. Who's in control? Who has the power? Right? Some of the clothes you wear, uh, it also signifies power. This is how powerful I am. Look what I'm wearing. I'm powerful. It costs a lot of money. These Jordans, you better believe I'm powerful. Hey. They were a gift, by the way. I have to say that. Somebody's like, why is a pastor wearing Jordans? That's where my tithe is going? <laughs> People say the craziest, dumbest things. I swear. I, I swear. Anything good, on that, good that I have, someone gave to me. I just have to disclaimer. But anyway. People say things like that all the time. It's just, but here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying. I, got, I lost my train of thought. Oh, power. You're seeking it. Status, social status is power. I want to hang out on poor people. I feel powerful. Or powerless. I don't belong in there. You ever go into a store and you're just like, the price tag is like $1,000 for a shirt. And you know, they know you don't have money. They can tell. <laughs> And you're trying to act like you do, but sometimes I don't, we don't belong here. Let's go. Let's go to Marshall's. <laughs> power. We're seeking it all the time. The, t- the car you drive represents a level of power. It does. The name brand represents power. The most powerful, the most powerful people have the tallest buildings. Go to New York. The most powerful people want the tallest buildings, the biggest houses. Um, big TVs, small Bibles. <laughs> Every time somebody gets a big old TV, I say, man, let me see your Bible. <laughs> it's a big TV. It's a little Bible. <laughs> power. We're all seeking it. And I think that's normal. But see, the power of God is different than what you think. It's not to build your empire. It's not to make a name for yourself. See, that's what the enemy wants. The power that the world lures you in, it's all about you. It's about your brand. It's about your name. It's not like that. I sound like first, but <laughs> Joseph Prince. It's about you. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not about you. 
at all. Now, 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 God wants you to have power because he created you for it. He created you for it. Let's, see, let's read this in Acts chapter 1. Uh, no, actually, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. And it says this. Um, this is God. Both riches and honor come from you. This is God. And you reign over all in your hand, power, and might. In your hand, it is to make great and to give strength to all. So God is generous. He has all power. He's almighty. And he gives us power. What for? Acts chapter 1, 8, he tells us, he tells his disciples, you're going to receive this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. You'll say, people will look to you and they'll see you and say, that looks like Jesus. That looks like God's image and likeness. That looks like heaven. That looks like God. You'll be a witness. You will know that you know. It's like when they look at my daughters, they're like, yep, you're the dad. Because I have, they have my DNA. They have my, 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 my image and likeness. And, and when, when we are filled with the Spirit of God, people should say, oh, that looks, like, that looks like God. That looks like God. That looks like God's offspring. Right? And, and so we receive power. And, and when we believe, and it's important because a lot of people, uh, they, they just pray the prayer and nothing changes. And I'm like, you don't want it enough. You got to want it a little bit more than that. Unfortunately, we need God more than we want him. Our need for him is a lot greater than our want for him. We want other things that are not, not even close to being as important. As a matter of fact, see, we, we need to be more united with our spouses than we really want to. Because we don't want to be inconvenienced. Did you hear what I just said? Your kids need you more than you're willing to be there. Okay, we, our need for God is so much greater than our want, and God forgive us for that. In other words, our need for him doesn't match our desires. There are things that we desire more than we desire God. And I know I'm speaking to you, because that truth is true for me. Okay, so, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Let's go to the next verse, uh, verse 2. 38, uh, chapter 2, 38. It says, Peter replied, each of you, because they asked, how must, how must we be saved? And this is what, what Peter replied. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Have you done that? You know, and be baptized. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you been baptized for the give, forgiveness of your sins? And then it says, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? If you have, you receive power. You receive power. Now, 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 how do we receive this power? Because unfortunately, there's a lot of weak, powerless Christians in the world. And I've been one of them uh, for an amount of time. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you because I'm, I'm connecting with the fact that I've been there. And I've been powerless uh, no power whatsoever. How many of you have guns? Uh, would you raise your hand if you have a gun? I'm, I'm not going to take them from you, so please raise your hand. <laughs> this is not a, I'm not, I'm not going to have you bring it in here, those of you who are carrying. <laughs> no. How many of you have guns? Put, raise your hand once more. Unashamed, right? Okay. Now, put your hands down. How many of you have ammo for the guns? Would you raise your hand? You have, you have bullets, ammo, ammunition, right? Okay. Now, what good is a gun without the ammo? What good is a gun without the ammo? I got a gun. Well, what are you going to do with it? Throw it at the guy? <laughs> You're going to hit him over the head with it? What are you going to do with the gun? I don't have ammo. Why? I just don't have time to buy some. Well, why don't you have ammo? Uh, I'm just really busy. I'm really busy. I just don't have time. I got so many things to do. Well, what's the point of having the gun? It's just, it, it just, I just use it to scare people. I just use it to identify, I just want them to know I have it. But what good is it if you don't have any ammo? What good is a believer who has no power? What good is it to be a Christian with no power? No ammo whatsoever. Convictions in the room, I feel it. 
And I was talking to Rudy several months ago, maybe a year ago or so, and, and he told me he works for Encore. And he says, you know what the craziest thing is every house uh, in this city that has, um, that has the ability to connect through electricity, um, they, all, they already have the ability to receive all the power they need. So, so the, the electrical companies, they already send power to every house as much as you'll ever need. It's already available to you. He says, when a person moves in, they get a contract with TXU or Ambit Energy, which is better than TXU. Or, or, uh, <laughs> shameless, right? Shame. Well, shameless plug. Um, so, so check this out. I have the mic, you know, there's power. <laughs> <laughs> so check this out. So if you have a contract, then now what happens is Encore comes on and makes sure you have a meter so that you can receive power. There's a contract. Now, now the house is powered up, okay? Now you go in there and you look at the lights and you're just like, but the lights aren't on. Well, go over there, flip the switch. No, 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 I'm going to pray about that. I'm going to let God do that. God, please flip the switch. That's not going to happen. And then you have like some type of like a refrigerator, you have a, a stove, you have a washer and a dryer, you have appliances, you have a TV, and you're just complaining, God, why isn't this working? And God's like, because you ain't plugged in. So even though now you have all the power available to you, you now have a contract with a company. If you don't plug in, there is no power. Now understand this, that God has made all power available to you. He sent his son who died on the cross for you. You have a covenant now with the heaven, with the heavenly father. All power is available to you. What are you going to do? You got to plug in. Well, if it was that simple, right? Why don't, okay, where's, where do I plug in? Hmm. Hmm. Like an avatar. Hmm. You know, how do we plug in? Well, that's the point. You plug in through the word of God. You know how sad it is that believers don't read the word? If I were to ask you, man, did you read this morning? Did you read yesterday? When is the last time you really read the word to soak, to really receive, to meditate, and to hear from God? And you're saying these are words that are eternal. It took over 1,500 years to write this, 44 different writers, one author, the Holy Spirit, and God made sure that I would have it in my hands. People died. People were burned. They were burned to get this in my hand. There were people that gave their lives so that I could read the word. When was the last time you read the word? When was the last time you plugged in? You know what the scripture says about the word? Hebrews 4.12. Check this out. For the word of God is alive. It's, it's like no other book. It's not to be read like in any other book. It's a living organism. It's God's word. It's alive and powerful. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we don't want our innermost thoughts and desires to be exposed. We read it, it reads us. Do you hear what I'm saying? So we have so many believers that are weak. Because they're not plugged in and they're just like dying spiritually and their faith is diluted and they're delusional and they don't have faith anymore. I'm losing my faith and, and the plug is right there and God's like, plug in, please. I'm not going to do it for you. I've already given you my spirit. All power is available to you. Plug in. You plug in through the word. You plug in through praise. You plug in through worship. The Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and truth. Why? He wants to transfer something to you. He wants you to reflect him. You become what you love. And so the point is this. You, tr you do this. When we pray, there's power in prayer. We are a house of prayer. The scripture says in James 5, 16, so powerful. It says this. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray each for each other so that you may be healed. You need to be healed. You need to pray for someone or someone pray for you. The earnest prayer of a righteous person. We are made righteous because of Jesus Christ. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You see, you plug in. When is the last time you truly took some time to pray? No wonder you feel weak. No wonder you feel very insecure about your faith, about your Christianity, about your place in God. You don't know what the book says. 
What good at football season's coming up? Who loves football? And some of you that don't, I get it. It's all good. We're praying for it. But fo- <laughs> football's from, from God. I'm just telling you right now. There's always good and evil combating each other. Someone's going to score. But anyway, and, and God is a Cowboys fan. So anyway, <laughs> you know that star, the bright morning star? Yeah, hey, the star, the star of David. <laughs> um, so anyway, check this out. What good is a football player, a quarterback that, has, that does not know the playbook? You got the best running back. Do you know the playbook? No, 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 I didn't study. What happened? I don't have time. I don't understand it. It's too hard to read. I start falling asleep. You think the coach is going to be like, oh, okay, I understand. I, I get it. You can still play. I know you're still strong and everything. You still run five. You can still play. Go ahead. He's going to fire your butt. And say, go sit down and learn that playbook. And don't come back to me until you know it. And he'll test you on it. What makes us think we can serve the God Almighty? I know I have a spirit of exhortation on me right now. I get it. But what makes it? I'm an, I'm, I'm an apostle. I'm correcting some things. But here's the point. What makes us think we can come before God and, and be ignorant of the playbook and not know it whatsoever when we put training wheels on it? We have devotionals that we give you every week. At least get on the training wheel. At least do that. Well, I don't have time for that. Come on now. All right? So the point is you got to plug in. You got to plug in. I think it's super important. That's where the power comes in. When we plug in, the power are in the promises of God. The power are in the promises because God himself gave us a promise that he would give us the Holy Spirit. How would we know that unless we read? Right? And so it's important. So how many of you are going to commit to plug it in? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you are going to commit? I'm going to plug in to the power and my life is forever going to change. Amen? All right. The second, the, second, the second point is important, um, but before I get to it, it's love. I mean, I'll just go ahead and tell you. You already know. Power, love, and a sound mind. The second point is love. Have you heard of Mike Tyson? Yeah. Unless you were really, really sheltered, you, won't, you have no idea who he is, or you're too young to know who he was, or he is. He's still alive. Mike Tyson was the greatest knockout punch boxer that ever lived. He won 50 times, 44 of his wins were by knockout. Within, you know, minutes, he would knock out his opponent. He was so strong and powerful, he only lost six times. And so, uh, the dude's a beast. He was a beast. And I was watching some uh, highlights of him, and the dude was so fast, so powerful. But here's the thing about him. He was only two years old when his father left him. Uh, He was only two years old. By the time he was 13, he was already in and out of juvenile and jail 38 times. 13. Right? His mom passed away when he was 16. His only sister, he had a brother and a sister. Uh, his sister passed away when she was 24. Young. And he was young as well. He had so much death in his life. And he was interviewed. And he says, I just remember I was so afraid. No, it's not. I'm just joking. <laughs> That's my best, that was my best attempt. He goes, <laughs> He goes, I, I just remember being so scared and so afraid. That's what he said. And when I, when I was listening to that interview, he goes, that's why I fought. I was so afraid. I couldn't trust anybody, he said. I didn't know who to trust. You see, the greatest fear that we have is separation. The reason why we got fear from the enemy, that's a little early, um, the reason why we have fear that came to us is because we were separated from God. Automatically, we had fear. You separate a child from his mother, there's going to be immediate fear. Immediate fear. Some of the issues that you have with love, it's because of separation, a divorce, abandonment, rejection. Some of the issues that you have, it's all connected to the fact that there was fear at an early age. Now, let me, let me say this to you. Um, the Bible says that God is love. First John chapter 4, I'm going to read this to you, 16 through, through 18, and, and I'm going to share this with you. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. All who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Now, see how many times love is up there? It's a lot. 
Because he wants us to know that God is love and that God loves us. And, and, and there's a process to it. Verse 17. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. Now, uh, let me read that again. As we live in God... Now, don't, don't miss this. Our love grows. Love is supposed to grow. Our love grows more perfect. Your love is supposed to grow into perfection. Now, let me ask you this question. Is your love for God growing into perfection? Is your love for others growing into perfection? In other words, do you love your spouse more now than you did yesterday, last year? Love grows. Okay? And if, if, if you're not, it stands to reason you're not being perfected because here's what the scripture says. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. Now, this is important, day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. That's expected of us. That's an expectation. The next verse. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Perfect love Cast out all fear. If we are afraid, now this is, this, here's the thing, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We have not fully experienced his perfect love. Now, now the disciples were arguing, who's the greatest among us? And, and one of the mothers came up to Jesus and said, can my, can my sons sit at, with you when you reign in your kingdom, one to the right, one to the left? And all the other disciples were like, how dare they? How dare she? Like, why did, you know, she got to ask first, basically, is why they were mad. They were envious. They were envious. And then Jesus said this. He says, those in authority, those that are rulers, they lord over the people and they flaunt their power and control. He says, and they flaunt their authority. And they think they're all that. They have so much pride because look at me. I make the decisions here. I have political power. I have, you know, economical power, period. I'm, I'm, look at me, Lord, over the people. I'm the boss. I'm the CEO. That's me. Here's my business card. Jesus says, that's not going to be that way for you. He says, the greatest among you must be your servant. And he says, for I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. Point in case. The power that you receive from God is not for you. It's not for you. It's for others. Um, Daniela and, and Refuge, can you come for a second? Or you could just sit right here. You could just come and stand right here. Can you give them a hand? They did an awesome job last week. <laughs> Attention, fear. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Um, so, so the scripture says that God loves you, right? That's one level. Understanding that God loves you is another level. As your love is being perfected, refuge understands God loved and saved and rescued him, not just because of him, but because of her. So in other words, God says, I saved you and I rescued you because I love her. Did you see it? And then he says to Daniela, Daniela, I saved you and I rescued you and, and I delivered you and I brought you all the way here from where you were born, from all that. I, I did all that because I love you, but not just because I love you, but because I love him. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, I rescued you guys. I brought you together. I united you, not just because I love both of you, but because I love Indy. That's, that's deeper. You see how, that, how, how deep that goes? You see, and that's the case, and thank you guys very much. Thank you for being examples. <laughs> so when you stand before God someday, and I learned this just yesterday. I was at, a, at an event, and, and the, this example was given. It was perfect for what I was going to teach today. So I was like, I'm taking it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, through that man of God. When you stand before God, he's not going to ask you how well you treated yourself. He's not going to say, um, hey, how much, how well did you love yourself? How many manicures and pedicures did you, how many massages did you get? How, 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 how many days did you treat yourself? Today's off, which is good. I think you need to do that, by the way. I'm not saying don't do that. He's not going to ask you how well you treated yourself. 
and how well you loved yourself. You know what he's going to ask you? How well did you love what I trusted you with? Your family, your spouse, your children. Oh, that's different. It's different. You see, fear keeps you from that. Ah, uh, this is a famous scripture that we'll read, but we look past it. But understand this in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. God says, I give you power to love because you're going to need it. You're going to need to be patient. It takes power to be patient. Do you know that? It takes power to be kind. Y'all, any fool, any, any weak person can be mean. Any weak person can be rude. Love is not jealous. It takes power not to be jealous. There's so much envy in the body of Christ. It, it just sickens me. I've dealt with this myself. Comparison. Some of you guys are offended with someone because you're envious of them. How could they? They didn't even want to have children. And they have children. They were playing around and messing around. They're not even married and they have children. I'm married and I want children. What's going on, God? Envy. Envy. They got the job and the promotion and I didn't. Envy. It takes power to celebrate someone that has what you want. It takes power to celebrate someone else's success. It takes power to be humble. Any fool can be boastful and proud. Any, but any evil person can be proud and arrogant. It's in your sinful nature, but it takes power to be humble. It takes power to love and to be humble and to say, forgive me. It takes power. The next verse. Man, I feel like preaching this. It takes power. It takes power. To not demand your own way. You know how easy it is to demand your own way, to control, to command. It takes power not to do that. To not be irritable. It takes power. You need the Holy Spirit to not be irritable. And it, it keeps no record of wrong, of being wrong. It takes power to love somebody enough that you love them like you've never been hurt. You don't keep record of their wrong. You're not looking to see what mistake they're going to make. It takes power to be gracious, to be merciful, to be faithful. It takes power to never give up. It takes power to be Hopeful. It takes power to endure through every circumstance. It takes the power of God to love. And it's not for you. Man, it's not for you. It's for others. God saved you because he loves the world. He sent his only son. And he loves the world. He, he gave his son because he loves the world. I'm telling you. When you understand that it takes power to love, it's different. God, I don't know how to love. I don't know how to love. I need power to love. And when you understand this, you plug in through the word. You plug in through praise, through prayer. And you receive all that you need so you can give it away. And before you know it, you have a sound mind. The third point is a sound mind. God says, God says I'm going to give you my spirit and you will receive power. And the power is to give yourself away, to sacrificially give, to serve. The power that's given to you is to understand instead of seeking to be understood. The power that I give you, and now I want you to have, I want you to have a sound mind. Understand this. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says this. Maybe you've never thought of it this way. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Who knew your mind had a reproductive system? He says, you got to gird up them. What you're producing is not godly thoughts. You better gird up the loins. You better put your pants on. And you, bet, you, bet, you better watch how you're spreading the seed thoughts because it will reproduce after its kind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The more that he's revealed, the presence of God is the absence of fear. You see it? Philippians chapter 4, verse yeah, first uh, six through nine says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, that's where the power is, and supplication, that's request, and thanksgiving, that's where the power is, and your request, and make, and let your request be made known to God, now, hold on, now, okay, now, okay, I'll, I'll just go, because we ran out of time, and look at the promise, this is the power, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Who needs their hearts and their minds guarded by God himself? Oh my gosh, God is on guard for me by his spirit? 
He's my security of my mind and my heart. That's what the scripture says. That's where the power is and the promises. Do you see it? Now, now, before I read, you can keep that up. Me and Phoebe have an ongoing battle. She's my four-year-old for the remote control. <laughs> the downstairs is mine and my wife's. We have a flat, it's a big TV, small, t- small Bible. I get it. It's a big TV. And, and she gets up sometimes before we do to get the control. Sometimes she hides it. It's bad. We have a fight. And we fight for control. See, with what channel, who's going to watch what? But there are other times where I'm watching something, like, and it's, it's maybe towards the evening. And you know how those commercials come on with previews, and some of the previews are bad and scary and stuff like that? What I automatically do is I switch the channel. Because I don't want her to see. I don't want her to, because to, kids, you'll tell them not to look. They'll be like, look. They hear the opposite. Don't look. They're curious. And she does, she does it, so I switch it. Before I would be like, close your eyes. And she's like, <laughs> she's just faking it. But I have the authority to change the channel. Because I don't want her eyes to see that. Okay? The point is this. You have authority to switch the channel on what you're focusing on, on what you're thinking about, on what you fix your eyes on. If not, it's like your, your control doing its own thing. It says, it's why I don't know. It's just on. It's just like I have no control. It's just like I have to watch this. It's just there. That is foolishness. Do not give the enemy control of your thoughts and your mind. And if he has control of your thoughts and your mind, I declare deliverance over you. The presence of God is the absence of fear. Next verse. Finally, brethren, and I'm landing this plane. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. You have control. Change the channel. The last verse. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do the promise. You have to do it. And God, the God of peace, will be with you. A sound mind is a, is a disciplined mind. Self-discipline, a sound mind. Anxiety is a lack of self-control. It's a lack of the presence of God at that very moment. I know what it feels like. The other night I was asleep and I had a terror. We had just an awesome leadership gathering. The presence of God was in my home. And in the middle of the night, a spirit of fear came into my room and my heart was pounding out of my chest because I was frightened. I woke up and I rebuked that and I was just like, man, my heartbeat was racing so fast. Some of you live in that space and you take a pill for it. Some of you live in that space and you take CDB or whatever it's called or you take another drink or you find a way to not have to deal with the fact that something is overtaking you. And instead of going to prayer, and there are things that are helpful, essential oils, all kinds of stuff. There's things that are helpful, I get it. But there's nothing more helpful than the presence of God. You were made for it. You were designed for his presence. He made you with himself in mind dwelling within you. Some of you have the presence of God. You've received it, but it needs to be stirred up right now. Just stir it up. Stir up the presence of God. Just say, God, I stir it up. I've forgotten that I have access to this great power, you. I've forgotten that I can come to you and receive your peace and that you would guard my heart and my mind. And I repent. I repent for going to other things. And we've all done it. I repent myself. I repent for binge watching because I don't want to deal with my issues. 
I, I repent, Lord, for, for, for just, just le- being lethargic. I, I repent for overeating. I, I, I repent all the things that we do in excess. I repent for just going on a shopping spree because I'm so anxious and nervous and I'm trying to feel better about myself. I repent for going to other things like lust, sin, because I really just want you. I just want you. Nothing else. I just want you. Nothing else. That's the truth, God. I just want you. Nothing else will do. I just want you. God, your presence is what I need. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. God, I need you. I need you. Some of you have never received the Holy Spirit. And I want to pray for you. I'm just going to declare, receive the Holy Spirit. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the gift to you is his presence, his spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's God himself. You were created to be filled with him. You know you've been feeling empty. You've been feeling void. You've had some dark days. God says, I'm going to fill you. You're going to have light. You're going to be formed in my image and likeness. He says, I'm going to illuminate you. I'm going to love you. You will not be empty anymore, alone. You will not be alone. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I want everyone to stand. If you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit before, I stir it up now. Stir up the gift. How do you stir it up? You remember. Just remember. Remember that God paid a high price for you and he gave you his spirit. Remember what it was like when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember. Stir it up. I remember, God. I remember. I remember. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to come to the altar. And we're going to worship, but I'm going to declare that you will receive the Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name. I'm declaring that over you. If you've never received the Holy Spirit and you want to, there's no shame. Don't let fear keep you in the seat. Come on. Don't let fear hold you back, the hesitation. Don't let that win. Let God's Spirit give you the boldness that it takes to draw to Him. Come, come, come. If you need help stirring up your Holy, the Holy Spirit within you, and you want us to agree with you in prayer, come. I'm going to make the altar call for both. If you need to receive it, come. If you need it stirred up, come. But let's not walk out of here the same. Enough with anxiety. Enough with fear. Enough with all the excuses. Enough with the torment. Enough with the tight night terrors. We're going to declare life over you. Come, come. By the power of Yeshua HaMeshach, Jesus Christ, I declare freedom over you. I declare and I, I rebuke. And let's just do it collectively, corporately. Let's just all agree. We rebuke the spirit of fear out of tree of life and, and out of every home. In the name of Jesus Christ, the spirit of fear is rejected. The agreement is broken by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the power of the cross and resurrection. In Jesus' name, no more fear. Now, right where you are, receive the spirit of God. <laughs>